The Plymouth Cordage Company had a cultural and historical significance that still resonates as a rope factory turned community that integrated immigrants into Americans and provided a happy and safe workplace for over 100 years. Here is the 2022 Bronze Telly Award winner for history, the Plymouth Cordage Company on the local scene. If you came to Plymouth back in the day, and in those days, that's where all the work was, actually. That's what prompted all the growth, and that's why you hear people say, well, North Plymouth has everything, because it started out here with the cottage company. North Plymouth is a seaside community, 39 miles south of Boston, where you can find a little bit of everything. To understand North Plymouth now, you must go back in time to 1824, when the Plymouth Cordage Company was established and laid the groundwork for what the small New England village would become. We were privileged to sit down with Bill Rudolph several months before his passing in May of 2020. Bill was the founder of the Plymouth Cordage Historical Society and curator of the Plymouth Cordage Museum. I started do doing a collection of cordage stuff when I was about 14 years old. My great aunt worked for the cordage as did my great great grandfather. Uh, so I was very interested in it as a kid. I got an opportunity to come here to work and not for Plymouth Cordage but for the then owners of uh, Saltwater Trust who owned the property in 1980 and I've been here ever since doing the construction. Uh, the curator part, it started in 2005. We decided we really needed to have a place to keep all the uh, memorabilia we had and keep the memory of the workers and the company alive. In 1824, when Born Spooner started the company, North Plymouth was pretty much farmland. Well, after the War of 1812, how or why he was there, I don't know, but he was in New Orleans. And he learned how to make rope down there using slave labor. He didn't believe in slavery. So he came back to Plymouth, vowing he'd start making better rope using free labor, meaning labor you paid for. In 1824, they filed the papers with the state, uh, starting the corporation. Plymouth Cordage Company. The hemp, which was the raw material used in those days, was imported from Russia. It had to come in big sailing ships across the Atlantic. It had to go into Boston, because as everybody knows, Plymouth Harbor, you, can't, you can almost walk across at low tide. So it had to be offloaded in Boston and put on smaller ships and brought down to Plymouth on the tides. Even with a small ship, you had to come in on high tide. For them, they would ship the rope because it was such quantities by ox cut. It would take three days to go from Plymouth to uh, Fairhaven, New Bedford. What's it take now, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? But they had to stay, sleep over two nights on the way out and two nights on the way back. The, he picked this location because it was a, the grist mill on the end of the pond. He was gonna use that to supply power to run the spinning wheels which is part of the rope making process. The other thing they had to build in 1824 was the rope walk. That started out being 900 feet. That, why so long? Because the, the sailing ships wanted 100 fathoms, which is 600 feet. So to make 600 feet of rope, you needed 900 feet of rope walk. The rope uh, shrinks in, in the process. It's similar to braiding hair. It shrinks by a third. Uh, that eventually ended up being over 1,400 feet long, went all the way from the end of the pond out front to Boundary Street. The biggest change came in 1845 when the railroad came to town. That facilitated moving by rail, all the raw material from Boston down, and all the finished goods, pretty much the whole East Coast was connected by rail, you know, by 1850. The company kept on growing, Right up in through and through the Civil War area, there was a lot era. There was a lot of uh, rope needed for the merchant uh, and warships. Uh, 
after the, after the Civil War, there was a lack of labor all up and down the East Coast for two reasons. One, a number of, of men and women had been lost in the war. And the second reason was the federal government was trying to populate the Midwest uh, to keep other nations from coming into the sparsely populated area. That meant there was a lack of labor all up and down the East Coast. And rope making was a very labor intensive business at that time. So they had, there'd been some Germans that had come over in the, on their own in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s and worked at the rope company, Cordage. And they sent them back to Germany to recruit friends, neighbors, relatives, people they would believe would be good workers and of good character. Uh, mainly friends, neighbors, you know, that type of thing that they really knew. And they were mandated to offer the fare over, not to give it to them, but to loan the money for the fare over. They would uh, supply them with, with housing for them and their families and a job. So that was, at that point, the Pr Franco-Prussian Wars have been going on for about a hundred years. So everybody wanted to get out of Dodge anyway. So. And most companies weren't offering any way to get over any loans for passage. So this was a big plus. So after they used up, this was in the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, um, they went all over Germany and they found in a little town called Ausweiler in Germany. They recruited my great great grandfather who came to work here in 1870. He was one of the first Germans over to work here. Uh, he worked where this building is now before the building was built. And then after this building was built, he, he came inside this building to work, Mill One. After the German population were made use of, they went to Italy, the area around Bologna, and offered the same deal. The two main towns there were Cento and Renazzo, where the immigrants came from. Much of the cultural melting pot that North Plymouth became can be attributed to the immigrant population the Rope Factory attracted as employees. We sat down with a longtime North Plymouth resident, Dave Malaguti, whose grandfather was one of the Cordage employees who immigrated here from Italy. Dave Malaguti, longtime uh, Plymouth resident all my life. Um, grew up here in North Plymouth, moved away uh, when my wife and I built a house up on, uh, off the Long Pond Road. Um, and recently we've moved back to North Plymouth because uh, we're living in my parents' house that I, um, you know, have control over now, you know. Sold our other house. Um, love it here in North Plymouth. A uh, little different from when I was a kid, but still a nice place. My relationship with the cottage, my immigrant grandfather who came over um, from Italy sometime around 1893, um, worked a couple of jobs. Uh, I, I think he was a weaver at one point, and I think he was a shoemaker at another point. But because he had some secondary education back in the old country, he was able to get a steam engineer's license. Now, that's a pretty impressive feat, considering the fact that the first thing you have to do is learn the language, um, and then you know take whatever test you need to take. And he became the night boiler operator down here at the cottage. I don't know how many years, and Bill Rudolph was trying to find it in the old records, but some of the old records had been burnt, and unfortunately, it's about that same period that my grandfather worked here. But I remember as a kid, um, the lines of people coming to the cottage, and they would be coming down that road, going into the plant, you know, doing the various tasks that they did. There were rope makers, there were dock men, there were warehouse people. This little engine was pulling materials all around um, to all the different places. Uh, raw materials going in and that same little engine and the others like it pulled the completed rope back out and brought them to the docks and warehouses where they were loaded on ships and shipped out. This is an antique. This is really an antique. This is actually a rope twister. And if you can see, 
one strand of rope came here, one strand came here, one strand came here. This had to make a very large rope because look at the size of the individual strands. And what you did is you fed the individual strands through these spots and then you twisted. And this is back in the days when it was manual labor. So you had a big wooden, probably a wooden or a steel bar that went through here and you twisted and twisted and twisted all the way down the rope walk until you had a completed rope. So now we had a whole bunch of Germans and a whole bunch of Italians in North Plymouth where there had been nobody for, you know, 20, 30 years before. Uh, then they went to, that was in, the, the Italians were 1880, 1890, up to around 1900. And 1890, 1900, up to 1930, they went to uh, mainland Portugal, Cape Verde Islands and the Azores and offered the same deal there. Followed by the Portuguese community, my name is Colleen Rice. Um, I lived in North Plymouth all of my life until I married my husband, Mark, uh, in 83. My great-grandfather, rather, um, worked there. He was an immigrant from Portugal, from the Azores Islands in Portugal. One of the reasons was because um, most of the Portuguese people in the Azores were Catholics and he wanted to be a Protestant. There were very few Protestants in the Azores. So he actually was a stowaway, is what I'm told, on a ship and came to this country. And when he went through customs, I'm not sure, I think he came right through Boston. And his name was Anton Schwaz in the Azores. But when he came through customs, they said, okay, your name is uh, Sears. He said, okay. <laughs> and from then on, he was known as Anton Sears. But when he came here, um, one of the first things he did was he um, found other Portuguese people who came here and they all built a little church in North Plymouth and they called it the North Methodist Church. Why did all these different populations flock to Cordage? Well that gave us a whole melting pot in North Plymouth. There were other nationalities here too that came into work. A bunch of French Canadians came down, there were people from uh, Scandinavia, a lot of people from England, France, Alsace-Lorraine. The company in 1899 started a welfare department, not meaning welfare like freebies, but welfare for the betterment of the workers. And they hired a man named William E.C. Nasro to be in charge of this department. And he'd studied with the great thinkers of, in, in Europe about what would make people happier in their work, be more productive. So he started building duplex houses around the ponds from the row houses that had been there. there was, the new houses were all duplexes. Born Spooner believed that happy employees who were well cared for make better workers. And this philosophy showed in the quality of the housing and the care the Cordage Company provided. Uh, my name is uh, Dick Quintle, um, originally from Plymouth, Massachusetts. Born in North Plymouth on Nick's Rock Road in the house I still own, actually, with my grandparents. Starting from where the cottage was, all the housing they built around there, or he built around there was for his workers. Um, and you could tell the different workers, you know what I mean? Some of them be eight units, six units, two units. If you look at the one I'm in right now, 429, it's actually got all the old woodwork in. Um, it, you know, so it had to be for somebody pretty important. It was a single family house and it was up and down, and um, the woodwork is, is beautiful. One of the things that the, the Cordage Company did was they built all the houses, the housing in North Plymouth. And to this day, actually, the, the most beautiful homes, I believe, in Plymouth are right there. The company started in 1900 an all-day kindergarten, where all of uh, workers, children 
that weren't in school could go to be like a daycare setup. So the women could go to work, meaning there'd be two incomes coming into the household to make things better. And at night they had cooking schools because a lot of the immigrants that had come in weren't familiar with the local vegetables and, and fruits, so they didn't know how to best prepare stuff nutritionally, food nutritionally, and to how to preserve it and stuff. Uh, they also had a, a Sloyd school for boys where they learned woodworking. They had uh, classes for the girls and how to make clothes and stuff of that nature. Uh, 1902, there was a scarlet fever outbreak in Plymouth County, not in Plymouth itself, but in Plymouth County. So they hired two visiting nurses that would go to your house and take care of you or any member of your family for free, uh, providing you work for the company. It, the nurses lived right on property and they were on call all the time. 1905, they added a clinic and a doctor again to take care of your health. Universal health care by 1910 with no co pays. Try getting that today. They started a library, the Loring Library that was up on the hill which has now moved across the street and is part of the uh, Lutheran Church. Uh, Mr. Loring was the, the major stockholder. Was interesting fact was that although there was Americanization classes in the building, they also had all the books in the classic language because the company believed that you shouldn't lose track of where you came from just because you were an American. These practices attracted a massive influx of European immigrants from the 1880s through the 1920s, including Northern Italians, French Canadian, Azorian, and mainland Portuguese, all seeking work at Cordage and a better life for their families. With this growth came the explosion of North Plymouth's shipping industry quickly making it the second largest shipping port in Massachusetts. By the late 19th century, the Plymouth Cordage Company had become the largest manufacturer of rope and twine in the world. The company believed, interestingly enough, that the reason they were successful, yeah, they had good people in charge, but the reason they were successful, the, the good people in charge didn't make, them, make the goods that were good and were world famous for their quality. If you made people healthy and happy, they'd work better and give you a better product. And the company believed in that. From Born Spooner through everybody else that was in there. After 140 years as the largest employer in Plymouth, the Plymouth Cordage Company closed its doors in 1964. The 45-acre space has been transformed in modern times into a bustling cordage commerce center, still populated by many descendants who have crossed the oceans to make a better life. North Plymouth's many parks, businesses, homes, and walking trails are never far from view of the cordage factory smokestack. It stands as a legacy and a beacon on the North Plymouth waterfront. We remember the Cordage Company for its role in making North Plymouth what it is today, and we remember Bill Rudolph for preserving an important part of North Plymouth and Massachusetts history. You can visit the Rudolph Pavilion amidst a duck pond on the small island in front of the main historic tower. Dedicated to Bill for his many years of service and historical preservation. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below before you go. We'll see you next time.